the prison of place and time was constructed to punish those who would violate the laws of place and time. It is perfectly inescapable for the reason that inmates and institutions are made of the same matter and share a perfect likeness. This unique arrangement was developed long before the existence of the first lawbreaker who would require housing, so that this remarkable structure may be seen as having created from its own substance the population of future criminals that it would one day contain. The mystery still remains hidden and untold as to why legal authorities would institute these laws of place and time, which by their very nature can never be broken, since they are identical with their would-be violators, who in any case are lifelong residents of the prison, condemned before birth to await that day when their sentence will be executed, that unknown day when they finally awaken to their prison surroundings and the event that is about to take place. When given the chance to make a statement, their last words are always the same. Any place but here. Any time but now. It's okay. They'll always say to you that it's all right. It's okay. It's all right. Under no circumstances will they say to you that it's not okay. Under no conditions will they say to you that it's not all right. It's okay. It's all right. If only once in the course of all time, if only once in the course of your life, they would say to you that it's not okay, that it's not all right. If only once they would give you the satisfaction of hearing it spoken, only once allow you to ride on those wonderful words and soar upon the spit and the snare and the astronomical relief of hearing it said, only once. They will never say it's not okay. They'll never say that it has never been, nor will it ever be the least bit right, in the least degree. It's okay. It's all right. There's nothing to do. Have they mentioned that you could get by quite easily? without knowing a single moment of what we call joy or what we call pleasure. That you can exist for many years, a lifetime in fact, and be estranged from anything we might call happiness, or simple relaxation. Yet continue to flourish right up to the very second that your own headstone looms into view. You know that it's true, but have they ever mentioned this to you? Have they ever mentioned that no one could get by? that nothing alive could remain so for long without the fear of hurt and dread of harm, without feeling the frustration or the anguish, or the full hell of unmitigated torment that is woven into everything that lives and comprises the very threats, holding it all together and true. Have they ever mentioned this to you? Pain is essential. There's nothing else to do. 
no other way to be. We can call it what we like, say the pain is something else, a part of something else, never fret about finding it to be otherwise, finding it untrue. Because pain is essential, it is all there is. So why would they ever mention this to you? Skull Crusher Due to the nature of physical existence, they cannot avoid imparting to select persons what it means to have one's skull crushed, either slowly or quickly, completely or partially, whether one is deliberately attacked by some skull crusher or simply the victim of some skull crushing accident. The reason that skull crushing cannot entirely be kept a secret by them is that such an event involves in many cases not only great bodily pain but also mental derangement and intense emotional agony, striking phenomena that are difficult to conceal even to the imagination of a brain that has not undergone an actual incidence of skull crushing. Nevertheless, they have succeeded in restricting the knowledge of what it means to have one's skull crushed to the extent that it is not a vital factor in forming the way the population in general thinks about what it means to sustain lasting and excruciating damage to any part of the human body, whether this part is a skull or the brain inside that skull, not to mention the spine and the similar developments that may ensue from spinal crushing, or even the effects of a pernicious disease affecting some other part of the anatomy that may be crushed from the inside one cell at a time. Insanity and nothingness. Stuff and nonsense, insanity, derangement, whatever name you want to use, we can't get enough of it. They've made sure of that. Offer us nothingness and we'll pass it by without a glance, given its invisibility to our sight. They've made sure of that too. In the dark corridors of our brains, and the black chaos of the world's marketplace, we will rush about as if in a dream to grab at every piece of pulsing inventory paraded out, a galaxy of arbitrary objects in all shapes and colors, a full array of unrequested needs, unrequested impulses, and of course, every accessory imaginable for those motley costumes of agony we are forced to wear every day of our lives, seizing such merchandise with a death grip and recalling only when our hands feel nothing and their closing grasp. Between insanity and nothingness, the choice was determined from the outset. They made sure of everything. Bottom line, no one is in the market for nothingness, while insanity, since time began, has always been flying off the shelves. sellers. Which of them would ever say that all they have to sell is a piece of fruit gone rotten? Shriveled and yet still pale green with a dying life made of mold. They would never tell you that what they are selling is something spoiled. A piece of fruit left forgotten unfit to be sold and ripe with pain.